This is uh, a rooftop in South America, and these are a bunch of uh, crazy cool uh, macaws that are hanging out there. And a great example of this um, new world that we're in, where humans now really are a huge dominant force on our planet. And that has um, mostly negative consequences for most uh, large, large critters around the planet. But some things can adapt, right? So, so some things um, are just like we've adapted to the landscape, some things have adapted to our landscape. And so in this case, um, these, these escaped, escaped uh, parrots basically have um, said, hey, this is kind of cool, I'm gonna hang out here. And, and they've sort of set up residency here. And we've seen the same thing in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, and Topanga Canyon with these um, tropical birds that, that historically weren't here, but have either escaped captivity or maybe been accidentally released um, and, uh, and, and have established their own um, feral colonies. Um, so when we talk about conservation biology, one of the key things we tend to think about are, are things that are disappearing, things that aren't here anymore. And so here's a couple examples from some of my projects in uh, Turkey. And so these are, the, on the left, these are um, uh, two wolf uh, pups. I can tell you guys the stories about these if you're curious, but two wolf pups that um, were brought to us. Why, did we, why were wolf pups brought to us? They were brought to us because in this particular culture in eastern Turkey, it's a very, um, very male, masculine culture, and it's very like beat your chest and tell you how, how macho I am. And so in that case, what, they, what uh, local villagers like to do is go um, and hunt wolves kill the wolves and then take the puppies as, as a trophy. And like, I'm a man, I don't, have, I don't just have a dog, I have a wolf, right? Um, and so they tend to do this mostly in wintertime when, when the, the female wolves are denned up and relatively easy to see. And, uh, and so uh, they do that and they bring these puppies home and they have these puppies for a couple weeks and then the puppies start to get sick because they're not like dogs, right? They don't behave like dogs. They have they have needs and they start to get things like distemper and stuff. And so th these are two pups that they um, brought to our NGO. And they're like, oh, we just randomly found these puppies like out in the forest. I'm like, really? And so, so that's an example of conservation biology. How do you engage those folks in a way that um, both protects the wolves, but also um, you know, makes the culture one that is not interested in, in taking out wolves and one that honors wolves. On the right there is an ibex, an endangered ibex, and that's just on some random dude's uh, backyard. This is an apartment building, um, where's this, near the uh, Georgian border. And so some guy just went up in the, in the forest and, and, and blew away um, an ibex, showing that there isn't much enforcement in this case, right? There isn't much concern over endangered critters. And uh, if, you, if you harm one, there, there doesn't appear to be much of a penalty. Just you know, leave it out on your, on your back porch and, and nothing bad will happen to you. Um, we sometimes, uh, increasingly in, in the crazy world that we're in these days, we sometimes think of disasters as something that's tied or associated with degraded environments. And so in this case, this is the Japanese tsunami um, about 11 years ago. Uh, and this is this giant wall of water, right, that, that uh, under, under water earthquake, boom, 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 triggers a, a, a jerking of the bottom of the ocean, which leads to a pressure wave. That, that goes in and, and hits um, and inundates large sections of the um, east coast of Japan, especially of northern Japan. And we know this most, most from Fukushima, the, the nuclear power plant that was inundated and then is still, we're still dealing with the consequences, but, but this, is, this is huge, right? Um, and what's being overwhelmed here isn't the natural system, the natural system is being impacted, but this is really the human system. So it's our systems that really, um, uh, bear the brunt, just like the natural systems bear the brunt, um, but we sometimes only really pay attention when it's our systems getting getting whacked. Also inherent in conservation biology, and this, these ideas that we'll talk about this semester, is um, is is inherent asp are inherent aspects of justice, right? So this is Haiti after the 2010 uh, uh, earthquake, um, and this is a, a, a shanty town. This is a, 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 a ramshackle area where folks that don't have a lot of money have built their homes and these homes aren't really built to any code and so when that when that um, disaster happened 
you know, a lot of folks lost their lives, a lot of folks lost their, their protection from the elements, all this and that, and this is what uh, they're left with. Um, and unfortunately now, as of this week, Haiti has no elected government. So the last elected representatives, um, their, their term officially ended. And so there's, there really is no actual government um, in, in the country at this point in time. Unfortunately, the, the president was assassinated last year by forces that are unclear who, who did it, but um, bad times. Why was the earthquake as bad as it was? Well, one, it was because people weren't you know, building structures super robustly, but it was also because of this. These are the hills behind, um, behind this is the, the upper watershed in some of these areas, right? So these are, this, this area should be forested. It should be lots of trees, lots of green vegetation, lots of shrubs. So when um, we do have earthquakes, when we do have rains after the earthquakes and this and that, um, uh, that water is, is captured in the soil, that, that water is channeled into to robust um, riparian systems and things of that nature. It's not. Instead, when we have these downpours in the wake of, and we have the same thing here in the wake of you know, wildfires, um, you just have this huge pouring in of water. And so, so folks in Haiti both suffer the earthquake and then in the immediate aftermath when these storms came through, they flooded, right? And so, so while we can't stop the earthquake that was gonna whack Haiti, we can absolutely, um, by choosing different options, um, have the flooding be minimally impactful and, and not as uh, destructive to life and property and, and livelihoods um, as it was in Haiti, unfortunately. Um, this is during the pandemic. I don't know if you guys remember this. This was, this was up in the San Francisco Bay Area in particular. Um, and this is Blade Runner, right? So this was like right, right around the time after uh, Blade Runner, the, the, the second installment of the Blade Runner uh, uh, movies came out and it looked super weird. So I'm from uh, the San Francisco Bay Area and my parents called me up and they're like, uh, this is super weird. Like I woke up and thought I slept till like, you know, slept in the, through the whole day, had a cold or something. And, and it was, you know, midday, it was dark. Um, or, or dusky, and they went outside, and this is what the outside looked like for um, two, three days. Uh, and it turns out that, that it, didn't, it didn't always look quite this orange, it looked more yellow, but everybody's um, cameras, everybody's iPhones are optimi or don't have the same kind of uh, light sensitivity chips as some of our other, other uh, more higher end cameras, and so, so things tend to look more orange than they were, so when people took pictures, the rest of the world was like, oh my God. It's Blade Runner, oh my God, crazy. So, um, uh, but this air quality, this is an example of air quality, right? Uh, an example of wildfires and, and our changed management of the landscape that is encouraging more and more fires that's leading to this type of, um, this type of uh, air. Um, it's, it's also important to note that when the first European explorers came to our part of the world, came to Los Angeles, right? They, they said it was smoky, right? They, they said the area that we would now call downtown LA or, or, or Santa Monica or, 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 or Palos Verdes, that area, um, was, had, a, had a consistent layer of smoke all over it. And that's because the native peoples were doing active management of the vegetation using fire, right? Not this scale fire, not, not, not burning up millions and millions of acres, but, but small little controlled, well, maybe not exactly controlled, but, but, but smaller scale burning, intentional burning, to manage the vegetation, to, to exert some influence on um, the plants and critters around there. Uh, and then just this summer, so this is Pakistan. Um, so Pakistan has been dealing with massive, massive droughts. And then this summer, we had massive, massive floods. And so um, again, this is totally screwed. This is totally screwed for wildlife and the natural ecosystem, but it's also totally screwed for the human uh, society. And the, um, here, uh, chair, chairs over there, and we have another one right here. If you guys need another chair. Um, so yeah, so this is this is this is uh, Pakistan this summer, and uh, this is not good. Um, yeah. There's lots of people on the planet. Lots and lots of people on the planet. Um, we also see this manifest in all kind of aspects of our lives, whether we recognize it or not. Has anybody tried to buy eggs lately? Yeah. They're super cheap, right? Yeah. 
Not, yeah, so, so they're, they've about doubled-ish, or depending on where you are. Some people say they've, some place where people buy, like, they're seven times the price or whatever, right? Um, uh, there's a bunch of reasons for that. One, um, some that we actively created for ourselves, and others that we um, are experiencing because of the choices we made, but we didn't try to create it. So the first one is here in California, we now have a free-range egg law. So any eggs sold commercially in California have to be free range, meaning not, not, the, not the birds in a little cramped up, like, you know, one foot by one foot box for their whole life, right? Which is generally a good thing, right? I think most people think that's a good thing. That's why voters approved it and all this and that. Um, but this is, a, this is a new policy, right? We've been, we've been factory farming eggs for quite some time. And that's how the industry's evolved. And so now we're in the process of pivoting. And so it was, it was, it was, we didn't have enough capacity. So, so egg producers, uh, folks that have chickens, are, are starting to shift to other productions. But as that was happening, a massive wave of bird flu has hit us. So this is another example of, um, of diseases uh, spreading, uh, spreading from critter to critter or jumping between critters that lead to explosive um, uh, growth of the disease and in cases like this, killing, I don't remember the exact number, millions and millions of chickens across just the western part of North America. The, middle, the Midwest is getting hit hard right now. So, so we have some, some policies, but then we're, being, um, ex then we're experiencing the consequences of our, of our historic management, in this case, um, packing lots and lots of birds in, in very tight quarters that aren't maybe the most sanitary uh, conditions. Okay, um, another example from uh, Turkey here in terms of when, we, when we're thinking about conservation biology. So anybody, rec you probably can't tell what this is. Any guesses as to what this is? This is hard to see. What's that? Yes, excellent. Sal got it. Wow, first guess. You guys are good. I'm going to start making, make, making harder things for you guys. Yes, yeah, so this is a dump. This is a, uh, a, a garbage dump um, by one of, near one of the villages uh, in, uh, in eastern Turkey. And... Um, uh, so people just, you know, dump their stuff there, dump their boxes, dump their old cars, dump their, their food and all that kind of stuff. And unfortunately what, it's, what it started doing is it started attracting uh, wildlife. So one of the things that it attracts, it attracts boar, it attracts wolves, and it attracts um, what we would call grizzly bears, uh, brown bears. Um, and these are big critters, like these are like really, really big animals. And so um, what started happening, I, I did I put a picture in? I didn't put a picture in. Um, so uh, people in the town, which is maybe like 10, 15 minute drive away, like, well, there's birds, or, birds, well, there's bears and wolves, let's go see. So they started driving out to the dump to see these large mammals out there doing their stuff. And they're in like a little Toyota, like a, or like a Honda Civic or something, right? And they're driving over these roads and it's, not the most well-maintained roads. And there's these big hundreds and hundreds of pound carnivores. Um, it was starting to get sketch, right? So, um, uh, so our NGO started, um, started uh, trapping bears and wolves and putting radio collars on them so we could follow their movements around and see where were they coming from, right? Were they all, were they all living at the dump? Were they living somewhere else and coming over and eating at the dump, et cetera? And so this is an international team um, led by our friend Josep Kusak, this guy who's um, uh, uh, one of the world's top uh, bear and wolf experts. And so this bear has been tranquilized and he's asleep. And we just put a, right here a radio collar on him. And, uh, and that's going to transmit, uh, sorry, not a radio collar, a GPS collar. That's going to transmit to satellite where this critter is. And then over time, we can look at its movement ecology. So we can look at, uh, is, it, is this an individual that's always around here or what? And, um, and it's, it's a non-trivial thing to do this kind of stuff. This is my friend, uh, Chan Shekajolu, who's a professor at University of Utah. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So uh, I'll just tell a quick story here, which is, um, so we finished up tagging this bear, and what you do is you, you, you um, 
we trap them with a leg trap that doesn't have teeth. It just has rubber, so it holds their leg but doesn't cut their leg. Same with wolves, same, same approach. And they get stuck and they, they can't move. And then we go and we, we dart them with um, what we would call a dart gun, but we're not allowed to have weapons in that part of Turkey, so we call it a medical delivery device. And so you poop, you medical delivery the dart to them. And then, uh, and then it puts them to sleep. And then we have a short, short amount of time, which is what all this stuff was, where people run in and everybody has a specific task and some people are measuring ticks, some people are drawing blood, some people are measuring how big the teeth are, all, all the different kind of stuff. We want to know how healthy this critter is. Weigh, weigh him, all that kind of stuff. And then, um, and then <coughs> um, when we're done, um, you give the bear uh, or, the, or the wolf or whatever it is um, a, a, a counter drug that will, will make him wake up. And so then we, we go away. And as we're doing this, we said, uh, I said, hey, let's get a picture. Because I don't have any pictures of these things, right? Or very few pictures. And my friend's like, OK, but we should, we should go fast. And I was like, OK, come on, we'll take a picture real fast. And so the, this guy was taking a picture. And then we're trying to get Josip, the, the, our friend, um, to come over and stand with us. And all of a sudden, the bear's like, Woof. And I don't have any other pictures because the bear got up. And so the left is the guy running away with the camera, and it's blurry. And, and, uh, and so it's very um, not good. Um, so the bear was all, and, 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 and you know, we're, the natural world is awesome. There's all kinds of cool stuff. Oftentimes, I, we as scientists, like, let me tell you how this works. And it a lot of times works that way, but not all the time. So in this case, what's, what typically happens is a bear kind of woof, sits up, and they're groggy, and they're kind of like looking around for a minute or two, and like, what just happened? And then, this bear is like, boom, up and running in like half a second. So did not read the textbook, that bear. Um, but we're doing this because of this, because people are blowing these critters away, right? We're doing this because these, these um, bears are coming closer and closer to people's sheep, closer and closer to people's livelihoods, to their kids or families. And they're like, screw this, I'm going to shoot this guy, right? And nobody wins in that situation, right? So by, by applying these ideas of conservation biology, by figuring out how these critters are moving, by figuring out um, why they're coming in, by educating the public, we can avoid having these uh, majestic creatures and important creatures get nuked. And again, another key part of conservation biology, if not the most important part, is the conservation side of stuff, not so much the biology side of stuff. So the conservation side of stuff is the human dimensions, is the human part, the sociology. The how do, we, how do we work on the people part, right? Sometimes we do have something like a new virus that's spreading around and we have to figure out a, a, you know, a vaccine or something of that nature. But the vast majority of the time, the, by far the hardest thing is managing us. It's not managing the bear, it's not managing the trees, it's figuring out how to, how to induce we humans to have a more sustainable relationship with these things. And part of that includes building capacity. So these are some of my uh, old assistants uh, in Turkey. And this is, the, this is the key thing, right? The key thing isn't for some weird old American dude to go over there and say, hey, you should do this or, or whatever. The key thing is to build capacity so the next generation, like these guys, can go in there and, and they can, they can um, uh, manage the resources and they can help avoid the conflicts and help um, uh, get stuff set up. So, so really solid conservation biology always has people folded in there. Actively is the, is the key fundamental part of it or, is, or is a, as an additional part, but always there. And if uh, for the vast majority of things we'll study this semester, if we don't have the people in there, maybe not there at the very first step, right? Maybe we're looking to see if there's a problem, but if they're not in there as part of the solution, it ain't gonna work. It just ain't gonna work, right? And so, um, so this is also fundamentally a, a human endeavor. It's not just about biology. It's not just about being out in nature and doing stuff. Okay, so uh, some uh, questions so far? Making sense? Okay. Um, so uh, the other thing is, is our, our footprint, the footprint of humanity is expanding, right? It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so um, this is, this is, these are some old slides from the last time I taught this class, but, but I could have grabbed anything, I could have spent, you know, half an hour and found something just like this today. So this is, this is more the norm. What we're looking at here, let's start on the left and look over at the left. 
and that is, so we're looking, um, we're over Asia, and we're looking um, eastward into the Pacific towards the Americas. And what we're seeing here is, so okay, so obviously this is land, this, this yellowish um, uh, uh, color is land. Obviously the blue is, blue is um, ocean, and the sort of lightish greenish color, that, that's a shallow, that's shallow water, shallow ocean, so, so coral reefs maybe, and, 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 and sandy shoals, things of that nature. And then also we have some clouds, but then we have this thing right here, this, this gray sort of triangle. And this is um, air pollution. This is air pollution from our iPhones. This is air pollution from our um, uh, refrigerators and uh, Fitbits and, and whatever the heck else uh, we, we're buying from China, right? So um, what we've essentially, what the world has essentially done is entered into a bargain with China that you make all of our crap and then we'll buy it for cheap. And uh, inherent in there is that you'll also bear the burden of the downsides of that manufacturing. So obviously there's things related to child labor and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But speaking just in terms of um, environmental conditions here, they're also producing a crap load of waste. They've been producing a crap load of waste. They are producing a crap load of waste. And, and for the first bit, it sort of stayed in China, right? And it kind of poisoned the local villagers, right? Which the outside world didn't, generally speaking, care that much about, right? But as the footprint, as the impact has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger over the last few decades, the scale of that pollution has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. So in this case, the air, the, the polluted air is now blowing across to other continents. So this air is now landing in Alaska, in California, in Wyoming, and we can detect those signals quite clearly. And so for example, um, here is a typical day in Beijing, right? So this is a, a colleague was um, uh, uh, in her hotel room, and she, I don't remember what floor, some high up floor, and she opened the curtains and she took a picture. And this is, this is not a foggy day, this is not a middle of winter rainstorm kind of thing, this is just regular old nice day. Um, when the Beijing Olympics were rolling around, and Beijing realized, and, and the Chinese government realized they wanted to portray a good, a good um, uh, the, the, sorry, this is two, two, Be two Beijing Olympics ago, two, 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 two Chinese Olympics ago. Um, they said, okay, they shut down all, uh, for three weeks, they shut down all the polluting industries all around, in the region around where the um, athletic events were happening. And when they did, her same hotel room looked like this, right? So we can influence this stuff. This isn't inevitable. We're not stuck in this. It's not like we, ha we have to have this for the next 50, 100 years. We can choose different types of manufacturing. We can choose different types of uh, uh, scrubbing technologies and stuff of that, that matter. And so, so this is what it, 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 it could look like. This is what it unfortunately does look like. But then with most things uh, that we have going on, um, uh, so the air is a relatively fast uh, turnaround in terms of uh, particulates in the air. Other things are harder to hide. And so when uh, folks came over early, and so for the Olympics, sometimes people, you know, get on a plane, show up and start to run or swim or whatever the heck. Other, other uh, types of um, uh, athletic events, uh, they, need, they need time to do stuff. So they, they need time to sort of get warmed up or, or get used to the t heat or whatever. So some of those athletes come earlier. They might come, like, so let's say a month earlier, and they kind of do their training in the local environment so, that, so they're, they're acclimated to it. And that was the case with the folks doing sailing. So over here um, is are, where some of the aquatic events were held. So some folks went to jump in the water and put their boat in the water, and there was so much algae, green algae, that they couldn't even get the boats in the water. And it was insane. And so, so they, couldn't, they couldn't practice sailing. So then when, and then, then, and then they started getting out, like, oh my God, the water's so polluted, we can't even sail boats. So then the Chinese government brought in the army, and the army spent about a, a couple weeks just physically raking and scraping and scooping up all the algae, and, and they finally got to a place where it was okay. And so then people could, then people could sail, and they had their, their activities and all that, right? But that took an insane, uh, process and it essentially within a couple weeks of the of the Olympics ending it was back to the same uh, massive algal bloom uh, conditions going on 
So um, that's not to pick on China. We could, we could pick wherever we want around the world. That was, that's, just, that's just one, but one example. But I would say what conservation's fundamental challenge is, the, the, I mean, we'll talk about all these, these ideas and principles and concepts and approaches over the course of the semester, but the fundamental thing, our fundamental concern is that our expanding footprint, the footprint of our species, of our civilization, is to the point now where we're threatening all, not, not all life. If, if we all, if a nuclear bomb went off tomorrow, life would not end. But the kind of life that you and I conceptualize absolutely is being threatened by our current civilization. So macroscopic life, the diversity of plants, the diversity of insects, mammals, right? We're, we're not so much screwing with the microbes, but, but for the macroscopic stuff, we're really threatening our heritage here. And so that comes in two, two ultimate forms. One is the number of people, how many humans are on the seven billion people that are on this planet, and, and how those humans use resources. Both are important. Different people with different political agendas will, have, will try to convince you that only one of these two things is important. They're both important. Make no mistake. So the, the story I always think of is uh, several years ago, I was at a, a Society for Conservation Biology conference in San Jose, California. And um, uh, it was a presidential banquet. And at a presidential banquet, all the attendees come and they sit down and they, they, they sit in big tables and they hear presentations while they eat food. And so I like to meet new people. And so there's this delegation from Africa. I'm like, I'm gonna go hang out with this African dude. So I went and I sat down, I'm like, hey, how's it going? I introduced myself. And like, hey, great. So everybody at the table was from Africa and I was the only one from North America. And so we're talking about stuff and we're having some uh, uh, libations and, and debating about things. And oh my God, what's the biggest problem? And so we eventually get down to this question. What's the ultimate, what's, what's the, Biggest thing, if we could just solve this one problem that, you know, snap our fingers somehow and solve this, that'd be great. And so I said, it's as, as the person from a wealthy developed country, uh, it's the number of people. There's too many people on the planet. And it, it leads to all these unintended and, and, and bad things. And my new friends from Africa were awesome. They were very polite. They like, oh yeah, totally. We totally get it. Yep, yep, that's a huge thing. But actually, what it, we think it is, is how intensely those people use resources. And then I said, oh, totally, totally get it. Yep, no, that's a huge problem, that's a huge problem, yeah, yeah. But it's really the number of people. And so we spent about six hours going back and forth. Ultimately, we were both right, right? But, um, but what, the, the wealthier, developed, um, uh, uh, more affluent countries tend to think the issue is the number of people. The more disenfranchised community that don't have access to resources and, and various things, they tend to say the problem is just um, the wealthy folks are, are, are too intensely using those, those resources. It's both. It's both of those things. So we won't spend a huge amount of time in this class talking about these ultimate drivers. These are really, really important. Um, but. Uh, but I do need to say that these are key, these are important, and we, we can't ignore these. So number of people and how they utilize resources. Okay, next I want to turn to talking about a question so far, making sense? I'm rambling on and people are, I don't know if I'm, if I'm depressing people yet or, or what's going on, or, or if people are asleep in the morning, I can't tell. Already depressed. Already depressed? All right, great. All right, cool. All right. So, um, so let's talk about uh, some central themes of conservation biology. So we won't necessarily spend a huge amount of time going into all these things, but you should definitely write these down. You should definitely be, be returning to them and, 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 and helping them organize uh, as, as we're thinking about uh, new challenges or new topics or how we're working on saving a critter or something. Okay, so the first one is that resources in today's day and age, our most, re most biological resources are overexploited. So they're, they're being impacted at a rate that's difficult or impossible for them to replenish their amount of wood, their amount of babies, their amount of 
offspring, whatever it is. So oftentimes resources are overexploited, and particularly in these conservation challenges we'll talk about. Next, uh, we've been farming, we've been engaged in agriculture for you know, at least 10,000 years, possibly longer. Ants have been doing it much, long, much longer with aphids and fungus and things, but we humans have been doing this, you know, actively manipulating things uh, for, uh, in a very intentional, spatially explicit way for at least 10,000 years. We've been hunting before then. Um, but in terms of bringing this new science of manipulation, this new, this new uh, 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 very specific directed way to encourage the recovery of critters, that's relatively new. And so generally speaking, for most of the cases that we're going to talk about this semester, and indeed most of the cases we deal with um, as, as a discipline, the populations, the communities, um, we haven't been manipulating them long enough to know if we're on the right track. We, we, we have suspicions, we have, we have some inklings, but in many cases um, we either haven't been managing them long enough or we just haven't been following their dynamics. We haven't been monitoring them long enough to sort of really have high confidence as to what's going on. What do I mean by that? Well, here's a quick example. So I, d I have a PhD. Um, it took me a long time to do my PhD because I did a lot of teaching and all kinds of other things. It took me um, almost seven years to get my PhD. Um, in the life so in, in ecology, the average is about five years-ish to get a PhD. It's going to depend on how much, if you go to a school with a lot of money or if you're doing a subject that's well funded. But generally speaking, that's what we're talking about. Three, you know, I, I had one, one of my TAs in grad school um, went out and uh, did some worked for his first summer and it totally failed. He got crap data, it didn't work. He, did, he was studying fish on a coral reef. He c couldn't, couldn't make it work and it was, oh my God, don't know what's going on. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. And then um, his second s field season, he figured something out. And he figured out that um, if he fed these fish, their behavior would change directly related to how much food he fed them. And so then he basically went down to the store, bought, he, bought a turkey baster and made some frozen food for the fish, and he would swim out to the reef, and he would little he would turkey baste their food into the mouths of these fish, and he got this awesome data. He's the only person I know that has done a PhD in ecology that finished in four years, right? Even though on paper people say, oh, your PhD is like four years, like baloney. Regardless, the funding cycle, the, the places that I go to to ask for money, to give me money so I can hire you guys or, or do research or, or if you want to go to grad school, places that will give you money to, to collect data. If you're doing a master's degree, that funding would typically be one year or maybe two years worth of funding. If you're doing a PhD, it's typically three or four years of funding to do your measuring of the bats or whatever, or counting the plants or whatever it is. We have a few things called long-term ecological research uh, projects funded by the National Science Foundation, for example, that are designed to like, you know, I'll give, we'll first give you money for seven years, but those are the exception. Those are not the norm. So most funding cycles, two, three years, something like that of money. That is not enough time to figure out what's going on with an elephant, right? Elephants can live 80 years old. Right? Or just to figure out what's going on with humpback whales. I mean, you can get some insights. I don't, I don't mean we don't learn anything. But, but, you know, you really need to follow that baby whale that becomes a teenager whale, that becomes a sexually mature whale, that starts to have kids whale, that starts to go into old age whale, that then dies whale, right? And then follow that kid's or that whale's offspring and so on and so forth. So consequently, we often are hampered by the temporal scale, by how long we've been looking at the thing, how long we've been studying the thing. And that's not to say we're stupid and we're dumb, we can't figure stuff out, but it is, we have to acknowledge it. That is real. That is real. Yeah, Caleb. Like, I know there's like a lot more robust uh, like simulations happening, like mm -hmm. programming and stuff. Could that be a potential like, solution to projects that would take like 80 years? Or something? Yeah, I don't want to say simulations are bullshit. But simulations are bullshit. Um, so 
So, uh, so they're not bullshit. <laughs> but but um, the model is only as good as the assumptions, and the models are only the, the output of the models are only as good as the inputs that we're getting. So one of the reasons we've gotten so good with our climate predictions is because folks have been working on large scale, planet scale models of the Earth for, I mean, like really seriously with like supercomputers for probably about 40, 50 years. And we have whole agencies that do nothing but collect temperature data, rainfall data, you know, and, and so we're parametizing this stuff with all this great data, right? Are our climate models perfect? By no means. But they're getting quite good. They really are getting quite good, right? That's the kind of scale we need for this, and we, we don't have. So I, I, don't, I don't mean to be flippant and say that, that simulations or models aren't helpful. They are helpful. But, but in many cases, the things we're talking about are data deficient. And having a model in a data deficient setting doesn't really help all that much. OK. Good. Uh, so, so, so we don't have large time scales, by and large, when we're talking about these these systems. Okay. Um, next, when we do come up with a thing, hey, let's 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 give the critter this drug. Let's 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 change the predators in the forest and see what happens or or what have you. Right. Generally speaking, the scale that that people like you and I develop these things very small. Right? We do it like, say, on the campus of CSUCI, or maybe in this corner of the Santa Monica Mountains kind of thing. Right? Um, and that's great, but oftentimes we need to apply it across Southern California or across the Western US or, or something of that nature. So, so we tend to develop, and so the analogy here is we tend to develop the interventions or the, or the res management responses at a relatively large scale and then hope they will work the same at the big scale. Sometimes they totally do, which is great, but they don't always work at the, the, the same way at larger scales. So, so we're oftentimes making our management decisions, uh, um, the initial guidance at small scales, even though we want it to work at a much bigger scale. Cool? Okay. Uh, uh, fourth is that history isn't necessarily a good predictor. And this is a huge, 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 huge problem. So ask anybody uh, uh, that we work with in New Orleans. Or don't, don't even go to New Orleans. A ask anybody um, here, Thomas Fire. Why didn't you evacuate? Or Woolsey Fire. Why didn't you evacuate? Well, you know. So I live, I live, I live at the top of the hill over here. Um, uh, my, my neighborhood was evacuated during the Springs Fire, during the Woolsey Fire. During the Woolsey Fire, I went back in and surveyed. Like 15% of my neighbors were, even though it was a mandatory evacuation, 15% of my neighbors are, were still at home with wildfire burn all around them. This was not an issue of poor folks didn't have transportation. This wasn't someone was stuck at home on a, on a iron lung and couldn't unplug it. No, no, no. These are people that actively said, I'm not going to go. Well-educated, well-resourced, um, you know, informed. They, they, they had smartphones and they were getting the warnings. Um, but when, you, when I would drive up and ask these folks, hey, why didn't you, how, why are you guys still here? And the answer was, you yeah, know, this happens every so often. It, you know, it, it's happened, it happened with Springs Fire, it happened with the blah, 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 right? Same thing with New Orleans, right? With New Orleans with Katrina, the answer, I mean, there's various, a lot, lot of things going on there, but, but one of the most common things people said was, I didn't think it would be that bad, right? So was that optimistic thinking? Yeah, probably some of that. But it was also using their past experience. The last big hurricane, so Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, the last big hurricane to hit the city of New Orleans directly before then was 1965. That was before I was born, right? So these folks had grown up, and yeah, they had hurricane warnings, and yeah, they had evacuations, but they're like, you know, it didn't, didn't really make, you know, we, it didn't cause any bad problems. So, so that's not to say that everything's the end of the world and the world's ending or anything like that, but, but it is to say that, that our world is changing, and so, 
the experiences that we've had over the last several decades or whatever. Um, of course, experience matters, but we have to be careful because that history isn't necessarily a good predictor of what's going to happen in the future. And relying too much on our past experience is really, really dangerous, increasingly dangerous, particularly when it comes to saving some of our rare species and ecosystems and stuff like that. We, just because it worked in the past, that ain't a guarantee it's going to be working in the future. Okay, and then um, uh, five is another sort of general humanism is that short-term consider considerations often trump long-term considerations. So, um, hey, we, we want to put in solar on our roof. Yep, okay, cool. Um, in the long term, that'd be great, right? When that next fire comes through and the power, the power turns off, I'll have power, right? But, man, I got to pay for it now, right? I got I to gotta buy the panels. And, the, and, and so it's like, well, yeah, I'd love to have it over the long term, but really, I don't have the money right now. And so I'll wait till next year. And the next year will come like, yeah, I don't really have the money right now. And, and, and that, that general, it's not nefarious, but that's just a, a natural part of human behavior, right? And so that's something we have to deal with also. Um, oh, it's too expensive to save the wild mustangs. Oh, it's too expensive to deal with the tranquilizing the mountain lions or, or whatever it is, right? Is it really too expensive? Um, and so oftentimes when we engage the community about different responses uh, that we want to take to conserve a, a resource or a critter or something, we have to work really hard and to try to push people out of the short, the only short term. Short, it's not that short term thinking isn't important. It is. But, but we need to also make sure that long term consideration it, it goes into the, the decision making and that people are fully understanding um, or as best as we can, make sure they're appreciating what, what's going to happen long term if we continue business as usual kind of thing. Okay, cool. Questions so far? Everybody's very quiet. Everybody's very quiet. Okay. Um, uh, next, uh, to, to really get effective solutions, we need to align stuff. And it's usually more than just the biology. So we need to align all of these different drivers, right? So people's livelihoods. We can't just say, don't stop fishing. Just don't fish, right? This, this guy's got to eat something. This guy's got to make money for his family, right? So we need to align the livelihoods, the values, all this stuff together. So while conservation biology is, is birthed out of and heavily grounded in biology, particularly ecology, but, but biology, it is it is not a quote unquote biological discipline per se. It has evolved. It's evolved to appreciate this number six here. It's evolved to understand that we must engage, we must be able to talk to people, We've gotta be able to talk to the rancher, We've gotta be able to talk to the homeowner, We've gotta be able to talk to all these folks, right? And, and understand their concerns and support their concerns and their needs, right? Um, to go forward. So that alignment is really key. Uh, and then number seven, um, related to a lot of these other things we've talked about, we will rarely, if ever, have perfect data. Okay, so this is not physics. This is not, um, generally speaking, molecular biology, where we do this stuff in the lab and we repeat it a thousand times so we have a fantastic sample size. Uh, as awesome as those, those disciplines are and as, and as cool as those disciplines are, we are dealing in the real world with restricted funding, restricted time, restricted spatial access and everything, and we oftentimes do not have ideal data. We will do everything we can to get high quality data, but because we're, we're dealing with, um, a res we're responding to a crisis often, we don't have the luxury of sitting around for 30 years measuring something and figuring out, uh, you know, that would be great if we did have that. And indeed, one, a, a key aspect of, of um, a conserva or, or, or sub-discipline of conservation biology, we could say, is people trying to find those, those longer time series, oftentimes with citizen science or non-traditional data sources, um, and sort of trying to use those things to, to, to try to get better data but the fact remains we almost always have imperfect data and we have to have some level of comfort with that. 
some level of comfort of do the best we can to get the best quality data, but then at some point we have to make a decision. We can't just wait another year, wait another year, wait another year, wait another year. Okay. And then lastly, um, despair is bullshit, right? So despair is a luxury. Despair is what, what people that have all kinds of time on their hands can do, right? We don't have time on our hands, right? So this is, I, could to I totally get how this, can, this, this study of conservation and study of the, the, the imperilment of the natural world can be scary and sad and, and oh my God, I'm gonna go drink a beer or smoke out and whatever, tune out or whatever. Uh, I totally get that. Um, but no, this is empowering, right? If, th if, we, if there wasn't a path forward, I would not be doing this, right? And my colleagues would not be doing this. So this ultimately is uh, a scary thing. We, n we never win all the time. We lose a lot. But we know how to do this stuff. We can figure this out. These problems, we created these problems. It wasn't some magic uh, 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 gauntlet from whatever multiverse that, that kills half of the life on Earth instantly with a snap of a thumb. This is something we did. And if we did it, we can undo it. And so, so um, I think this is, so, so there's, there tends to be a lot of gallows humor and a lot of like, you know, black comedy and, and you know, and kind of you know, ha 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 kind of stuff laughing in this face of depression and stuff. But that's okay. That's okay, right? Um, this discipline is desperately needed for our planet. And even if you guys don't become conservation biologists like for a career, I hope at least some of you do. But if you don't do that, you need to understand this stuff. Because even if you're working in healthcare or, or biotech or whatever, these decisions are increasingly going to be, uh, to do some of these significant decisions, we need public buy-in. You'll be asked to vote on things. You'll be at Thanksgiving dinner with your crazy, crazy uncle. And he'll say some crazy uncle shit. And you need to go, <laughs> take a sip of beer. And then anyway, yeah, that's not how it is, dude, right? And not in an a-hole way, not in a jerky way that, that, that starts to throw mashed potatoes back and forth and then say thing about your mom and all that kind of stuff. But, but, but in a way that is like effective, a way that is engaging, a way that is, hey, man, yeah, go ahead, vent. Let me hear, you, let me hear your crazy conspiracy theory about how aliens are whatever, eating babies or something. Um, okay, thanks. Now let's talk about reality, right? Now let's, let's go forward. And, and if we get depressed and if we, get, if we say the world is over and oh, there's nothing we can do, then we are totally done. And I am not ready to say we're done on this planet and we are not by any means done on this planet. We're up for, we're up for some very hard times, but it's not the end of the world. It doesn't have to be the end of the world. 